Jeff, we're ready. Hi, Michelle, Senior Editor, American Purpose. Thank you. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. Welcome to everybody today. We have some colleagues who are joining in progress and as we speak, and we have colleagues today from the United States, East, West Coast, in between. We have some friends from Europe and a splendid pair of conversation partners, an exciting new book to talk about. Um, Bill, welcome. Um, I describe you as uh, really one of America's leading culture critics and essayists on a range of issues on politics and society and technology and uh, uh, important things that we're all caring deeply about today. And we're gonna talk about your new collection of essays. And, and I think it's fair to say, well, if I'm wrong, you'll correct me, your best work of the last three decades. Kate Epstein is gonna moderate. Kate is uh, a professor of history at Rutgers. She's a distinguished scholar, essayist. She writes for American Purpose. She's a member of the American Purpose editorial board. And Kate, you had a column yesterday in Wall Street's, uh, in yesterday's Wall Street Journal on how it is, you argue, that the most fervent of Trump supporters and the most fervent of Trump's opponents actually have a lot in common, lo and behold. Michelle will put that and other things relevant and on Bill's book in chat. But Kate, over to you to set the scene, to give a proper introduction of Bill and the new book and take it from there. Welcome, Kate. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, it's a, a real pleasure and privilege um, to get to welcome um, Bill Derezowitz to American Purpose and to moderate this conversation. Um, I've been a fan of Bill's work uh, for a long time. Um, he's an award-winning author um, and one of the smartest critics of American culture and higher education working today, I think. Uh, after majoring in science in college, which is a fun fact that I learned from reading uh, this, this uh, collection of essays, um, he fled to the humanities, um, got a PhD in English and taught at Yale and Columbia before leaving academia to become a full-time writer. One of the essays um, in the book is about that decision. It is both very funny um, and also poignant. Uh, he's here with us today to discuss his latest book, The End of Solitude, which gathers uh, several dozen of his best essays, including the two that first actually kind of caught my eye and um, made me pay attention. One on solitude and leadership, um, which is an address he gave to the graduating class at West Point um, a number of years ago, uh, and another one entitled The Neoliberal Arts, and we're just delighted to have him here with us today. So to get us started, um, I'm gonna ask Bill some questions um, just um, to get things flowing for probably 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, then we're gonna open things up to audience Q and A. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to either just raise your hand using the, the Zoom feature um, or uh, just write it in the chat, um, which I think both Michelle and I will keep an eye on. And, um, uh, and without further ado, uh, let me plunge in. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd start with just a couple of kind of broad um, 30,000 foot questions. Um, Bill, could you um, start by just explaining the title of the book? Um, because you, you mean something quite, quite specific by solitude. Yeah, um, I, yes, I, I should say that, uh, you know, titles can be sometimes hyperbolic. And The End of Solitude, the title of the book, is from the title of the first essay, uh, which I had when I submitted it uh, to, to the publication, I just called it the decline of solitude. So, you know, and editors, you know, just like the death of the artist, that wasn't my title either. But, I was gonna say, there's a real finality to your title. I mean, it's, you've been on a real uplifting kick with your I know, uh, I know. titles so I just of late. I to stipulate that. <laughs> um, but in that title essay, which actually is from 2009. That's right. Is, a, is sort of, my reflections on my first year on Facebook and the first year of a lot of my friends and what it was doing to us. 
was uh, that, so that solitude and loneliness and aloneness are different things, right? So aloneness is, is, let's say, the objective state of being by yourself. You can look at someone and see whether they're alone. And then the question becomes, how do you, how do you respond to that objective condition? You know, you can, you can, it can make you feel lonely. It can make you feel an absence and a sorrow, or it can give you the opportunity for what I'm calling solitude, which I understand as a kind of a fullness or plenitude. And I think about, and I talk about Thoreau, and I talk about Whitman and the ability to, I think ultimately solitude is about the ability to let things come in. To, to create the space that enables things to come in. And those things can mean your own thoughts and feelings that you generally either try to avoid or simply don't have the opportunity to be in touch with. Or, you know, if you're, if you're Whitman kind of in a, in a trance walking down the street or down the, the lane, uh, letting the world in, the social world, the physical, the natural world. And I think, you know, I mean, I think at this point, everyone understands this and everyone's felt this, that the world of social media and even more the world of the smartphone, which didn't really even exist when I wrote that essay or had just been introduced, that that has taken, I was gonna say taken away our opportunity to experience solitude, but really no one's forcing us to do that. It's just, these things are addictive. And so we've lost the habit and in many, instances that I think we've even lost the concept and the ideal of solitude. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a re that's kind of a recurring theme um, in the book um, is the kind of multi-pronged assault <laughs> um, on the ability to be alone with one's thoughts, to develop um, kind of one's thoughts um, and to experience that as a, an opportunity and as something good uh, rather than as something to flee from. Um, okay, so let me um, ask is my next question then, what drove you to, to publish this collection now, um, rather than a couple of years ago or a couple of years in the future? Oh, again, I'm going to start by, by giving you an answer that sort of peeks behind the publication process. This okay. Of, I've wanted to publish this for a long time, and uh, I finally had a chance to do it. Um, I convinced uh, the publisher of The Death of the Artist, Holt, to also take this collection when I signed the contract six years ago. Um, I should say that I've wanted to publish a collection of my work for many years, so many years that uh, by this point, all of the essays, that, almost all of the essays that are in the book were, were not even written by the time that I first wanted to publish a collection. Um, th I, this collection doesn't include any of my fiction reviews which are, is work I'm proud of, and hopefully someday there'll be a second collection. Yeah. But back in the day, I thought that's mostly what it was gonna be. And then I had to keep putting it off, putting it off. I mean, I was told like, no, now's not the time, now's not the time. And finally I got to do it. So it's just whenever I could get it out, gotcha. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Yeah. It's also I also, one thing I, I, it was a revelation to me is that I actually had no idea that you had a background in dance um, and as a dance uh, yeah. critic, which is, I gather, where it all kind of began for you. Yeah, another fun fact. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, without making a long story about it, um, I was in journalism school after college. I didn't really know what I was doing there. I didn't particularly like the program. It was like intensely anti-intellectual. By the way, I prefer anti-intellectual journalists to pseudo intellectual journalists, <laughs> which is what we have now. But this was back in 87, so a different world. And I, I took a, a, a class in dance criticism across the street at Barnard College from a wonderful teacher and working critic. And it not only enabled me to start, she helped me start writing dance reviews and publishing them, but um, it also opened my eyes to the arts. She did mm -hmm. in a way that had never happened before. And it really set my life down a different path. It's why I finally gave myself permission to go uh, try to go back to graduate school to get a PhD in English. I'd always, I, I wish I had studied English Lit, but I just, I, I made a hasty decision when I chose my major. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. 
And this I was one of my, I, we actually overlapped at Yale. I was there um, as an undergrad from, from 2000 to 2004. I also see Molly Worthen um, on this yes, call, uh, who, who also, Molly. there's clearly something about being at Yale in the, the first decade of the 21st century that, that leads people to become trenchant critics. Um, but, um, um, and I'm, it's one of my regrets actually, right? I didn't take a class with you. I was a history major, um, not an English major, but um, anyway. Um, Okay, um, so one of the one of the things that you is a recurring theme in all of your work and in, in many of the essays that are collect, uh, collected in this book um, is about the humanities um, and the kind of uh, the straits in which they find themselves. Um, you talk about um, on the one hand, kind of the the Walmartization, the adjunctification um, of of the human, well, higher ed as a whole, but but certainly um, the the humanities, um, and I mean that's that's sort of the central thesis of one of the, the one of the essays that kind of brought your work to my attention on the neoliberal arts is the right. the way in which kind of market discipline um, is is just swallowing everything in its path, including. Um, higher education, which ideally would have a, a, a broader set of values um, that it might respond to. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you're also a very sharp critic of the humanities themselves and kind of what's been happening to them kind of internally at, at the same time as they're under threat um, from the outside. And so I was just wondering kind of if you see a, a path forward for the humanities um, given that I mean, you outline almost, it, it read to me as almost like a skill in Charybdis, you know, caught between um, its own internal problems and this external force um, that is really threatening to, to destroy them. Um, and so I, I just wondered how you think about that. Yeah. And I should say that I have a new piece in Liberties about great books courses, Leon oh, terrific. quarterly, okay. where I yep. further pursue. You know, um, I would say about that what I would say about the question of solitude or the question of what college is for in other respects, you know, the individual, you know, is, is um, I don't offer systemic solutions, partly because I don't think that way, partly because in some sense, a solution is a prediction, right? I mean, when you offer a solution, you're predicting that this solution will work and, and also that it's even impossible to implement. And I, I, I don't like to write, I don't like to write about the future because I can't see it. Uh, it's hard enough to write about the present, let alone the past. So all of my work, more or less, I mean, sometimes I toss out solutions, but just what, what would be good if we, but I mean, fundamentally my work is addressed to the individual because my argument, my premise is that the individual always has the power to chart their own course. Of course, there are institutional constraints and sometimes financial constraints and so forth. But my point is, do I see a path forward for the humanities in the academy? I mean, sure. I mean, we could rededicate ourselves to the core purposes of the, is that gonna happen? I think there's less and less likelihood that it's gonna happen at all. I heard from an old friend from graduate school who's been teaching at a public university for decades now in response to the great books course in Liberties. And he said, you know, 20 years ago, my younger colleagues or his peers actually at that point uh, were, were opposed to great books courses. As he put it, they didn't wanna to transmit to their students the work that had shaped them, which is a beautiful way to put it. Now, his younger colleagues, uh, haven't read them at all and, and sort of are like afraid to read them. Like it's, he said, it's like the dark web. It's like a place you don't want to go. So I have no hope that, that, that we're going to get back to that given the situation. So the question is, what can the individual do? Well, uh, I, think, I think they're always still, maybe they're depending on where you are, they're always the one or two faculty members who, who, who can who are still doing it. I like to say it's like it happens behind closed doors. It happens in the cracks, uh, the institutional interstices. More and more I hear from people who are involved in some kind of alternative. Uh, there's the Catherine Project, which people say, you know, it started by Zena Hitz at St. John's and it's online, small groups. 
and, and, and various other things that we could enumerate. I think what I'm saying is that more and more people are expressing dissatisfaction at the fact that they, they don't feel like they ever got what they wanted, that true humanistic education. Sometimes they realize that when they're still in school or right after, sometimes it takes 20 years. And they're trying to do something. They're trying to find a way to give it, give it to themselves, get it, or give it to others. These are very small scale solutions. Maybe, you know, like Substack, like podcasting, which, is, which are also growing uh, in the space created by the abdication of large established authoritative institutions, these small scale responses will be able to grow and flourish. Who knows? Okay. Um, that's actually one thing that really uh, resonated with me in the, the piece on, on why you left academia was kind of the culture shock of going to uh, graduate school in English lit and kind of going because you loved books and you loved talking about ideas um, and discovering that that's not what a graduate program um, in English lit uh, really is, is focused on, um, which is something it's, it, as a historian, um, I, I, you know, I grew up reading history um, in part, I don't know, I, I, in a very, in some ways in a 19th century way, you know, I was looking for moral instruction, uh, which grad, grad, grad school ruined me for um, reading history, but um, there, there is um, uh, some soulfulness has been lost um, in um, graduate training across the board, I think, in the humanities. Um, so that actually leads me to um, uh, my next question, which is to ask you um, to reflect on whether, how the problems with the humanities, um, the kind of institutional abdication that you describe from within, but also uh, the kind of pressures coming on them from without, how, if at all, uh, that might be related to the kind of broader political dysfunction um, in the United States. Are they related? Um, if, if so, in what ways, or are, are they not related at all? I've never thought about that. I'm not sure they're related. I mean, depending on what you mean by the dysfunction, I think the dysfunction is a much more recent phenomenon, although some people would date it to Newt Gingrich in 1994 and the whole way that uh, Congress changed as a result. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, you know, reading your work, I was, yeah, just, I was just thinking about, um, I don't know, the, the, the extreme polarization, yeah. um, the, the flattening of so much um, sort of quasi intellectual discourse, you know, the group think, um, which seems to be running or running amok um, uh, across the American landscape. I mean, these are things that the humanities kind of properly taught uh, would, would help inoculate against. <laughs> oh, I see. I, I thought I, I, I was thinking of it in reverse first, okay. which is so I got to graduate school in 1989 and I was immediately plunged into uh, an intellectual climate, politicized uh, sort of orthodox leftism, uh, heavy on French theory that was contained within graduate departments of the humanities and has since, you know, kind of jumped the walls of the zoo and is running amok in the culture at large and is now uh, much of the content of, of the polarized situation on the left, right? I mean, it, it's relatively recent, but it's kind of, uh, I'm not sure which has been opportunistically colonized by which. Okay. But you're saying, well, if the humanities were doing their job, would, would we not have as much polarization? I'm very reluctant to make that argument. Okay. Uh, I, in general, the arguments that sort of say like the humanities are going to save the world if they're if they're taught properly, save the country. I don't really buy that too much. I mean, I think they could make for a better culture, and I think they certainly could make for better graduates or, you know, better. We have to talk about what that means. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Um, let me, I'll ask, um, I'll ask one more question and then open things up. So if people are, are wanting to um, get in on the conversation, please feel free to start raising hands and, and writing in the chat. Um, you, you just, you, you just said that you think of it as, um, you know, something has changed on the left relatively recently. Um, do you, how, th this is just something I wonder about myself. And so I'm curious about your take on it. You, you have an essay in here entitled political correctness, um, which is the kind of the term that I grew up with um, to describe kind of a sort of certain left-wing intellectual orthodoxy. My question is what, if, if any relationship does that have to the, what seems to be the more modern coinage, which is wokeness? Um, oh, I think it's just the same thing okay. under a different name. Okay. With, new, you know, new... with some, I mean, the, I, the ideology sort of continues to evolve, but it's basically okay. the same creature. Okay. All right. All right. That's, I, I've been, um, I, I keep reverting to a sort of um, incubation metaphor um, in my own mind that it was uh, in some way, uh, Political kind of the, the new ideology seems to me to have harder edges in certain respects than what I, I grew up with. But there's also uh, some very strong lines of continuity um, between them as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I was just curious what your take was. Yeah. Um, OK, um, well, let me let me ask if if others here uh, would like to, to jump in with questions. Um, I don't want to I don't want to dominate the entire time. Molly Worthen. Uh, thanks so much. This is so much fun. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Bill, I took your British novel class many years ago. It was one of the best classes I took at Yale. I still think about it. I still think about those books. And that informs the question I have. Uh, it, it has seemed to me that much of the, the, the crisis of confidence in the humanities um, is connected, and I would say this is connected to, to Kate's question about, about how we bridge this to understanding the, the broader political picture. It's connected to a crisis of confidence on the left generally, and that is um, a, a failure to, but also perhaps an inability to articulate fundamental presuppositions and, and to, to really say, this is what liberalism is. This is what secular liberalism is. And I think about the novels I read in your class. You know, I think about something like someone like E.M. Forster, and, and this worldview, you know, only connect, right? The, you know, the great kind of punchline of Howard's End, uh, this worldview that says you shouldn't need, you do not need uh, these sort of metaphysical supernatural certainties in order to have this view of, of human nature that undergirds, you know, the, the great kind of liberal enlightenment multicultural experiment. But it seems that we're in a different place on the left and in the humanities now where uh, professors who, who, who teach in, in, in these subjects are uh, afraid to or, or don't actually know what their own values are. They don't make the case uh, for a worldview and they're not, um, they're reluctant to see part of their job as helping students understand what their worldview is and what the kind of alternatives are. I wondered, my question is sort of evolving as I'm talking, but I'm wondering, you know, thinking back on how you approach teaching, did you approach it, you know, with this sort of worldview in mind? Why is it that uh, professors who teach great novels, who teach history, who teach philosophy, don't seem to have, don't seem to see themselves as in the worldview business, not in a kind of didactic way, but in a simply part of our job is, as you say in your liberties piece, to be, you know, fellow seekers in sort of figuring out what our presuppositions are, what the presuppositions are of, of other people in our society and, and how we can begin to claw our way back to a, a kind of a civil place of mutual understanding and collaboration. This all sounds so much more well thought out and articulate than any, any philosophy of teaching that I ever developed. I just like the books and I wanted to share those books with other people. But look, I mean, now that you make me think about it, there was a supposition there that I took for granted and was the naivete that I brought into graduate school in 1989 that Kate referred to earlier, which is that, um, you know, of course, books and art in general are there to shape us. They're there to enable us to 
undertake in a continuous way this exploration that this is what it means to be human, that this sort of like intense sort of interaction with, with literature that I experienced in college and in my 20s, that this is just what you do. This is just what you do. And of course, everyone recognizes its value and everyone wants to debate who the best writers are and, and, and urge them on you. I mean, this is what people did when I went to college or at least, you know, a certain share of people did. And I think I still haven't um, uh, recovered from the fact that this is just like not really a thing anymore. And, um, and that this is, not the, uh, this is not what's driving professors of literature to teach. Although, I mean, there were, there, were, there, are, there were some, I mean, I feel like there were others at Yale. They didn't necessarily fare very well in the profession either. Um, so, so I, I, you know, and, and I didn't, I didn't, like I said, I didn't have a developed philosophy about it. I just, I guess I shared my enthusiasm and, and hope that my enthusiasm was infectious and really also just took for granted that these works are incredibly powerful. They're like the greatest things in the world. If you're a certain kind of person, they are just going to seize you. And, uh, and I didn't need to have to, I didn't have to make the case beyond that. Does that make sense? It makes sense, although I also, the, the essay you have where you, I think it is the neoliberal arts, although it might be, it might be a different one where you, uh, you quote Steven Pinker um, yeah. saying, you know, um, uh, it's not, uh, my, my lecture halls are half empty, um, my, my students aren't here to learn about a soul, how to have a soul. And you say, well, that's why your, your lecture halls are half empty. So it's an interesting thing where like a lot of um, students are, mm. I mean, they're gravitating towards easy classes in some ways. Um, I mean, like we have a new major on our campus in health sciences, which is really not preparing them for, uh, it's, it's a vocational major. Um, it, it's not. Uh, it has barely any pretense to be something other than that. Um, but there's kids, like, but there are the, I don't know, kids haven't, or young people, I shouldn't call them kids, but young people, they haven't lost that desire for meaning, it seems to me. And so some oh. of them are, are just desperate <laughs> for um, classes that really kind of challenge them to, to think in the way that you were, you were trying to do. You talk, and you talk about having some of those students at Yale, the kind of the searchers. Um, oh, listen, I completely agree with that. And, and you just reminded me that at least as of a few years ago, uh, to go back to your question of, is there a path forward for the humanities? But when I maybe still felt that there was, I used to say that that student hunger and curiosity that you just referred to is a perpetually renewable resource yeah. that we were crazy for squandering and we always have it there to tap into. The problem is that just given the way the profession of, you know, being a humanities professor has evolved, uh, you know, um, there are fewer and fewer people are, are, are offering that. And it's, I mean, it gets back to like the essay on why I left. I didn't leave to, you know, the answer is I left because I didn't have a choice and I didn't have a choice because the things we're talking about were not rewarded. And, and everybody understands that, everybody in the profession understands that. So even if they're inclined to be that kind of teacher uh, and to be that kind of scholar and writer, they suppress it, you know? And then sometimes like years later, like Frank Langtrichia, like they, you know, they confess, you know, well, actually I love literature all the time, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't admit it, which you know, drives me crazy. If we're ever gonna even begin to get out of this, it needs to be, you know, people like Frank Langtrichia, who was a big deal at one time to actually say something. But, but it's just, you know, it's just so unacceptable uh, intellectually, politically, ideologically to say that. To be earnest in that way. <laughs> to be earnest, to say that you love literature, yeah. to say that you think that in some ways literature has some kind of universal uh, value. Right. But I told it, but yeah, I like the, the notion of that as a, you know, uh, uh, a perennially renewable resource because like so many young people are so earnest. They're just like, 
they so want to talk about this stuff. And I should have said, by the way, I, I should have, um, for those of you who don't know Molly Worthen's name and work, you should, um, but Molly um, uh, is a specialist in uh, American religion and American intellectual life more broadly and also writes for the New York Times um, on higher education. Um, so um, let me, the, the, there's a question in the, uh, that came to me uh, privately through the chat um, from Chuck Lane. Um, which uh, I will pose to you now, Bill. Um, how is your work different from or similar to Tony Cronman's The Ends of Education? Um, he emphasized the humanities are to help students explore the purpose and meaning of life, but have abandoned that function uh, in return for a combination of indoctrination and careerism. Of course, this uh, would, this would also I, depend I, on you knowing yeah. that book. Which... I, I know of the book, I didn't read it just because, to be honest, there are kind of a lot of books like that, yeah. uh, including, you know, I mean, uh, insofar as we're talking about this sp specific thing, I'm, I basically agree with that idea. I mean, I think, aside from the fact that I write about a lot of other stuff, even when I write about that, I try to put it in a larger context of what's been happening to the university, what's been happening to the economy, what's been happening to the culture, that that's kind of the point of the, the piece you've referred to several times now, the neoliberal arts. I should say sometimes editors pick titles that are better than anything I could think of. That was Harper's. I love that title, the neoliberal arts. What, and it's about what happens to education in the age of neoliberalism, meaning an age in which the only values are market values. The only thing that's recognized in terms of education, K through 12, as well as college, is how well is it going to prepare you for the job market? And so that's actually, there's a question that's just come in. Uh, if Michael Allen, if I could um, pause, uh, call on you in just a moment, because um, there's a question that's again, just come in through the chat that bears directly on the, uh, the question of the job market, um, which is about um, the difficulty um, of advising uh, fr from someone in the humanities philosophy, um, who teaches, advises undergraduates, and there's a serious demand side problem, um, as Harriet Baber writes, in that it's very tough to get a decent job with a humanities degree. Um, the percentage of graduates who are working at jobs that don't require college is in double digits. Um, I can't in conscience, she writes, encourage any student who isn't heading either to law school or independently wealthy to major in philosophy. Um, of course, it's a terrific value to a person to have majored in philosophy, but how do you sell that to employers um, is the question. Um, how do you sell the humanities to employers? I don't buy the premise. Now, to be perfectly frank, it depends a lot on where you're teaching. If you're teaching at a selective school, I don't think there's any argument there uh, because I don't have numbers at my fingertips, but I've, I've seen surveys of employers and uh, articles from people who are in a position to know. It is simply not true that majoring in the humanities disables you for the job market. You can't look at the first job after college. Uh, college student, you know, you know, new college graduates have always been underemployed. Uh, you have to look at 10 years out the, uh, you know, yes, humanities majors make much less when they first graduate than STEM majors, but, with, but within 10 years, the gap has narrowed significantly. Employers generally don't care what you major in. 70% uh, of people are in jobs that are not connect, of college graduates are in jobs that are not connected to their major. So it's really as much as anything, a problem of communi communication to students and families of course, they're, you can say it a hundred times and they won't believe you. But if, you, if you're going to a selective college, especially, uh, getting a rigorous education that's gonna teach you how to think, that's gonna give you those quote unquote soft skills, which are actually really important in the job market. I mean, that's why the income gap starts to narrow because soft skills become more and more important as you go along in your career and are giving more and more responsibilities and hard skills become obsolescent, right? I mean, and Larry Summers has talked about this. Like anything you learn in college in STEM fields is gonna be out of date in five or 10 years. So it's about 
learning how to teach yourself, most importantly, learning how to uh, think across disciplines, learning how to communicate, learning how to work with people, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's my argument. Um, it's very hard to convince students of that. And of course, as college becomes more expensive and students are taking on more and more debt and they can't afford to just kind of be underemployed for the first years, I understand that that becomes a harder and harder argument to make. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Michael Allen. Thank you. <clears throat> Saul, uh, Saul Bellow writes somewhere about how as, a, uh, as an ardent young Trotskyist, he'd be sitting around his mother's kitchen table discussing the revolutionary prospects, etc., with his uh, comrades. And his mother comes in and says, you know, Saul, your friends are very, very clever and very, very stupid. And I was thinking of this story the other day because uh, my son recently graduated from Tulane in the humanities and he was around at the house with several of his friends, also graduates in the humanities from Stanford, UCLA, et cetera, et cetera. And of course they were all pontificating on contemporary politics with the dogmatic certainties that you have at that, that age. But I asked each of them to name one book from their college, all recently graduated this year, one book that influenced their theory or it changed their minds in some way. Not a single one of them could come up with any, any text or even any theorist or any group of texts. And uh, I thought about this when I, you wrote a piece recently, I can't recall where, but uh, explaining why you dropped out of academia or gave up on academia. Um, I think one of the points that you made was that uh, students being, uh, were being taught to think ideologically. That was the litmus test um, rather than critical intelligence. So my, my question is really, because I know I have other friends and colleagues who have uh, also dabbled in or experimented with academic careers and who have frankly been alienated for many of the same reasons that you have uh, because of the cancel culture, the dogmatism, the political correctness and so on. But my concern is, is there a danger that that whole terrain is being vacated to the, ideologi to the ideologues and that we're consigning our our children to this uh, excuse for an education, whereas we should perhaps and explain me explain if you can how we would do it that we should contest this terrain and um, fight back against the ideologues if that's feasible. I, absolutely, and I just want to underscore what you, what your anecdote illustrates. And I I, I wrote about this in a piece a, a, a more recent piece, not in the book. The full version came out in the Dutch journal Nexus, and then there was a shorter version in Unheard, you know, uh, the, the English uh, website, uh, where I talk about, among other things, that yes, college students have always been ideological, it comes with the terrain, but back, you know, before wokeness became the orthodoxy, say when I was in school, uh, and earlier, you had competing orthodoxies. You know, you had the feminists and the Marxists and and the Freudians at a, you know at a certain point. And even within each of those, there were competing strains of feminism, competing varieties of Marxism. Famously, you know, the Trotskyites facing off against the Stalinists at City College in the '30s. And as a result, people had to, people had to read a lot. I mean, you were expected to to know what you were talking about because if you didn't, you'd be made to look like a fool. Uh, one of the consequences of having an, a, a, a monolithic ideology is that you don't have to read anymore. And of course, it's reinforced by the fact that people have a lot of trouble reading more than a few paragraphs at a time anyway. So it, it's sort of this ideology, uh, this rigidity uh, doubled by, by ignorance. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like it's a well-worn theme, but for reasons we could talk about, this has slowly taken over the academy and not just the humanities, you know, it's a lot of the social sciences and apparently it's even spreading to some of the sciences, to medical schools and so forth. Um, but, you know, there has been some kind of counter movement. Now, I think it's very hard within the academy because the social pressures and the professional pressures are just so intense, it seems very hard for people to raise their heads above the trenches. But I alluded earlier to people writing on Substack, to people doing podcasts, to people starting new institutions. 
I, I'm not so sure about that new university in Austin, but at least I'm, I hope that they go in a good direction and other very, you know, heterodox academy. So, uh, and, and the good thing is that this can sort of feed on itself, right? The more people who stand up in public and show their courage, the more people are encouraged themselves to not be fearful. Thank you. Um, let me get, uh, I was, if I could just chime in there. I, one of the things that, um, I don't know, it's, it, it, it does take some nerve to stick your head above the parapet, but one of my mentors told me um, it's, it's very hard to be brave when you have tenure, um, just in the sense that uh, <laughs> um, this was someone who, who had spent nine months in federal prison uh, rather than uh, take the oath of enlistment during uh, the Vietnam War um, uh, or seek a student deferment, which he thought was an instrument of class privilege. Um, and uh, I always remember it's, a, it's totally different for, for adjuncts, um, but if you've got tenure, you've got more economic security than 99.9999, you know, people on earth. Um, and you're, you know, it's, it's not exactly being Nelson Mandela um so um that's one of the things but the but the but the pressure the the way you internalize the the social pressure um it, it can be really debilitating um so um anyway sorry um yes i i saw sorry chuck lane just pointed in the uh out in the the chat section james sweet has tenure and he's president of the aha and he's capitulated instantly i don't know if people know the reference but sweet um, put out, who's a historian of Africa, put out a, um, a sort of president's message um, suggesting that there might be some, some um, problems with presentism and identity politics in um, the 1619 project and the historical profession. Um, and within 48 hours, um, posted an apology um, message um, uh, because there had been an outcry. I, I presume much of it was um, on, on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know for sure. But um, but yeah, so that's that's the illusion. And, and uh, Molly uh, says, yes, Josh Katz, of course, at Princeton, um, uh, tenure is only a strong protection if your institution wants you there. If they want to fire you, they will find a way. Fair point. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that's a... Um, a hell of a story. Um, but let me, um, let me call on um, David Allerhand, who's got his hand up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So I'm currently wrapping up a master's degree um, in government, and you've touched on social sciences a little bit. And I just want to ask about, I guess this would have been really good 10 years ago when I was applying to my bachelor's, but I experienced a lot of backlash from these professors based on my own views. And, you know, I was under the impression, maybe I was too naive at the time, that I was getting a liberal arts education. However, I don't need to tell anyone on this call what, how, prof how professors kind of act when they hear a view they don't agree with. I did have some professors that did agree with me, but there were instances in which I was screamed at, honestly, by a professor for having more, let's say, conservative views than the professor did. And as I said, it. So what advice do you give to someone that's currently entering the job market? Or for example, I have a cousin that's 18 who has similar views to me. And he said, like, I'm a little nervous to express my views in class because I don't want my grades to jeopardize, or I don't want a future employer in my case to, you know, judge me on who I am or what my resume has, since there are some conservative views, or I've written some work that I'm aiming to get published in conservative publications. So how can you balance that? Because I come from like the enlightenment view where it doesn't really matter. I want to hear your view. So what advice do you have for in my 18 year old cousin or for me entering the job market, how to tolerate this? You know, you mentioned the University of Austin. I kind of wish that was a school back in the day. I say back then, I'm only 28, but back in the day when I was applying to schools and I am reading Substacks all the time, I'm listening to podcasts all the time. But so what advice do you have to counter this cancel culture woke wokeness that's going on because I've even had classmates just come down on me because now the whole thing is I want to study political science or history the two things I majored in because you know I want to be an activist or 
I want to be the next, you know, social justice warrior. But to me, I wanted to study political science because I wanted to read John Locke, John Stuart Mill. I wanted to read all these and examine these texts. So what advice do you have? It's incredibly hard. I mean, if you want to get a job, I mean, it's it's really fucked up that, that things are like this. I mean, you're making me think, you know, I guess, it, I mean, there were, there were, you know, the odd conservative professor, maybe at Yale, maybe at Columbia. And, you know, people didn't like that they were conservative and they might've, you know, gritted their teeth, but I don't, I'm not aware that there were consequences for their being conservative. You know, people just didn't like their views. And now the fact that it's actually a professional impediment and even for college students, I mean, I don't know what to say. I guess you're supposed to just, what, keep quiet about what you believe until you get tenure, but then you're gonna keep, keep on keeping quiet. I mean, it's ridiculous. And for an 18 year old, I can't expect them to have the strength to withstand that kind of anathematization in their peer group or the strength to do what I sort of did in graduate school is to keep my mouth shut and just, you know, I learned that, you know, one form of retaliation is to just silently hate people. But, you know, uh, I mean, how, I, I, I honestly, I don't have advice. Um, it, you know, except, I mean, it's easy to say, well, just say what you believe and show that you're strong. And then it'll also be, you know, you know, you will feel much more, I think you'll feel a lot of internal power when you do that. Uh, but you also might not uh, be able to get a job somewhere. Thank you. And yeah, there are real, I mean, there's institutional, um, forms of institutional payback that, uh, that students um, as well as faculty have to, have to fear. Um, Josh Spodek, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, sorry. Yes, and I hope you can hear me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I went to Columbia College undergrad and value the <clears throat> liberal arts education that I got with Lidham and CC and things like that, which I assume Bill remembers and knows about because he's written about. Something that I didn't get until later in life was, well, I, I presume that you would value not just reading Shakespeare, but seeing it performed and also uh, seeing great art, listening to great music. Something that I didn't get until later in life was going on stage myself to perform and creating mm -hmm. something, creating works of beauty to put onto the world, knowing that you know I'd make something that I really cared about, and people would put it down, but I still had to get back out there. And the practice of making works of art, the practice of expressing one's truth and beauty, uh, and do I? How do you feel about that part of education? Because I didn't feel it was particularly strong in there. And and something I would lump into there also, and I wonder if you think similarly, would be playing sports and other active things where you can win, but you can lose, and you still have to go back out there. Yeah. Uh, well, sports, I mean, uh, I, I agree with you about sports. Given the college admissions process now, I think most, most selective college students have played sports in high school, or many of them have, because it's part of the, one of the 58 things you have to put on your resume. And hopefully there's some character lessons that are learned, although it doesn't seem like maybe that actually does happen because it doesn't seem to transfer to like the ability to accept adversity, but let's leave that aside. Your question about the arts is a really interesting one and I haven't thought about it. I've hardly ever thought about it, but you know, I know there was a recent article about Black Mountain College and I, a year or two, I finally got around to reading Martin Duberman's book about Black Mountain College, which is a place I've always been fascinated by, especially because I was a dance critic and Merce Cunningham was my, my Artist, one of my artistic heroes. Uh, Black Mountain put the arts at the center of a college education. The arts, not the liberal arts, not the humanities. What does that mean? What does that look like? I, I wanna know more about that. It's, and absolutely the arts are marginalized on campus because they don't fit the model. I mean, even, I mean, the humanities can pretend to fit the model of, you know, the creation of positive knowledge, but the arts are a totally different thing. Professors, academics often have, a, have had a lot of trouble dealing with even the existence of arts programs on their campus. They don't really understand what they're doing there. But what would it look like to construct a college education where actually practicing the arts is central or, or central with perhaps the humanities? Um, it's a question I would like to explore more. That's all I can say right now. 
Sure, and you well, you have an essay which in this collection, which I think was one of the, the new ones um, that hadn't been published before on, um, I want to say the minded, uh, the maker's hand, yes. um, not the not the minded hand, but the, um, which was, uh, I think, a commencement address. You right, gave? at an arts college. At an arts college, yeah. It's gone out of business. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> because, because independent art schools are, don't have a business model anymore. Right, right. Uh, but um, but you're, what, what would you want to say about that? Oh no! I just that it, it it might might be of interest um, to um, uh, to Dr. Spodek Spodek because um, uh, you it's something that I I guess that represents a kind of potentially early foray um, into the subject of an arts a fine arts uh, centered education. Um, that, uh, even though it's you say it's something that you'd like to do more thinking about. Um, okay, there's been a couple of um, uh, comments in the uh, chat that I just want to make sure I'm not missing. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I, I won't read that. They're mostly comments rather than questions. Um, so I would refer people to the, the chat to read them. Um, does anyone, are there any other questions? Uh, Ch I, Chuck Lane had a, a sort of form, I, I, I suppose it was half a comment and half a question on whether the um, Ivies are returning to their original mission of um, creating a puritanical priesthood. Um, uh, and I mean, this John McWhorter and, and a number of others have kind of made the comparison. And I think you actually play with that comparison in, in at least one of the essays in your book between kind of the new political orthodoxy on the left and religion. Um, I don't know, what do you, I, I've never thought of it quite that way. What do you uh, think? Well, and I should say something that I don't say in that uh, essay, which is called On Political Correctness, and I've, That's I've, I've okay. written it more recently, I would have just called it On Wokeness. Uh, I make the religion analogy more recently. I've heard this first from Wesley Yang, who's a brilliant commentator on mm. this stuff, that it specifically inherits, that wokeness specifically inherits uh, sort of the sort of the New England Puritan or Anglo-American form of Protestantism, uh, and that and it and its sort of moral energies and and moral contours. Uh, I haven't thought about it in terms of a return. You know, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, a return in the sense that yes, these energies uh, have continued to course through the culture and manifest in different ways. Actually, lately, I, I want to try to write something about this. Lately, I've been thinking about institutions like the NEA, the NEH, and, in, and public broadcasting, which all came out in this, of the 60s, or in the, start in the 60s, and, and sort of the whole sort of in, institutional framework of culture that was built out after World War II in general, including in the universities, as a kind of new, um, a new form of moral instruction, surveillance, like, like there's this, there's this, you know, it's like, you, you know, it used to be that the middle class would sort of, the churches would take care of the middle class. The upper class was, you know, they were all dissolute anyway, but it didn't matter because they could do what they wanted. And the working class, you know, you always had, uh, you know, the, the nightstick to take care of them. But all of a sudden we have this, you know, after the war, sort of the churches are maybe beginning or at least we're getting more secular and there's this kind of unruly new culture and this mass middle class and it's losing its roots. And it's like, oh my God, like the, you know, the old Puritan establishment is like, oh my God, we need to teach these people. This is what I'm trying to say. We need to teach, teach these people how they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to think, how they're supposed to act. We need to, um, and, and, and a lot of the things, I have to be honest, a lot of the things that I've always sort of, you know, bought into, like, yeah, we need to elevate, we need to instruct, we need, people need to use their leisure class in a more, you know, noble way. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily use those words. And now I think because I've been reading Dave Hickey, you know, who's such a terrific critic of all of this, like, gee, I was kind of buying into this idea that people like need to be told, like, what pleasures are acceptable and what pleasures aren't. And they're, we, they need their betters to tell them. Uh, and so 
that was a long way of saying like, yeah. And, and it's just gotten, I mean, more and more entrenched. Plus there was this sort of like absorption of French theory into this kind of puritanical moral sort of authority that's created this kind of monstrous hybrid. Does that, does that make any sense? Um, yes, I, I, it also sounds like the setup for a joke, a uh, Puritan and a French theorist walk into a bar. Um, yes, and when they come out, they're a professor. And when they <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, indeed, indeed. Um, let me, um, okay, so I think we're um, winding up here. Um, I also just wanted to, um, uh, Michael Allen just posted a link to something by Wesley Yang in the comments and um, David Allerand, uh, Aller, Aller, Allerand uh, reminded me of, I was blanking on the author, uh, Noah, Noah Rothman's uh, new book um, on the new Puritans, which also kind of yes. um, plays with this question as well. Um, so let me, um, let me, we've only got two minutes left and American Purpose is very careful um, about actually ending on time. So let me um, actually just turn um, things back over to, if Michelle wants to say anything, I know Jeff had to step out um, uh, to deal with something, but let me, uh, on Jeff's behalf, um, and hopefully not preempting Michelle here, just thank everyone for coming um, for the the comments and the questions, um, and especially to, to thank Bill again um, for, for being here with us. Um, this was, like I said, it was a great pleasure. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Kate. Beautifully led. Um, on behalf of Jeff, I really want to thank you, Bill. He greatly regrets he had to leave early. This was a hugely fascinating conversation. I think the audience questions and engagement shows it. Um, Molly, I'm thinking a lot about your question. Thank you so much for that and the way you just crystallized things. Um, but everyone, thanks for being here. And again, thanks to you both. Thanks, Bye, everyone. everybody. This is really great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.